Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm Zachary Elwood. You can learn more about this podcast at behavior-podcast.com. In today's episode, recorded August 30th, 2021, I talked to Jennifer Cohn, that's C-O-H-N, about American election security. Jennifer is an attorney and election integrity advocate. Her writings about election integrity have appeared in the New York Review of Books, Salon, Who, What, Why, and TYT Investigates. Since the 2016 election, she's focused her professional efforts exclusively on investigating and exposing our country's insecure computerized elections. A compilation of her written work and interviews can be found at protectourvotes.com. Regarding Jennifer's law background, she graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1989 and Hastings College of the Law in 1993. She was a law partner at Nielsen, Haley, and Abbott in Marin County for many years, where she specialized in insurance coverage and civil appeals. Before that, she specialized in criminal appellate law. The reason I was interested to talk to Jennifer was because she's a liberal person who's been convinced for several years that her elections are not secure, that they have many vulnerabilities. And during the Trump years from 2016 to 2020, she'd gotten a decent amount of coverage and media invites to talk about that. So I was curious how things were going for her now in our very polarized landscape where the right has become the party of distrusting the election. And because those claims from the right are so low evidence and extreme, the left can have an understandable motivation to be the group saying, no, there are no problems here. The elections are fine. And Jennifer Cohn is someone who's been saying for a while, no, the elections are not fine. We need to do more. So I was interested to talk with her about her experiences and frustrations in the current environment. How does all this relate to behavior and psychology, which is the main focus of this podcast? I think it's a bit related because it's interesting to me how a very politically polarized environment can lead to people lacking nuance and going to one extreme of the election is rigged or the election is perfectly fine. So that was my main interest. But honestly, I was just also curious to learn more about election security and figured it'd be an interesting discussion. So here's Jennifer Cohn on American election security. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. One thing I was interested in with your work is how our very polarized uh, environment has affected how liberal people have responded to your work. And after Trump refused to accept the election, which everybody paying attention knew that he would, and after he called it rigged and illegitimate, and as that topic has polarized us around the topic of election security, have you seen a shift in how interested uh, people on the liberal side are in your work uh, regarding election security? Absolutely. I certainly had a lot more invitations on podcasts and things um, before the election and even you know, between 2017, at all times really between 2017 and 2020 than after. Although there, I will say immediately after an election, oftentimes there isn't as much interest as, as beforehand, at least among people whose candidate won the presidential race. So yeah, I've seen a shift, a, a downtick. And in particular, the, the main place where I've noticed it though, isn't even so much on podcasts. It's more that there were a number of You'd call them high influencers on Twitter with the blue checks, and some of them are media personalities with, you know, upward of about a a million followers. And some of them used to retweet me quite a bit and kind of stopped. And also I had uh, Hillary Clinton had planned to interview me, but then when Biden Mm. won, that was canceled. Right. It seems like you know in, in a very understandable way it seems like the you know as as we're so polarized if trump is the one if trump and his friends are the one concerned about election security then the liberal side can't be the ones concerned about election security even though they're very you know there's there's obviously very different topics and and different issues involved uh and it seems like yeah on this issue as with a lot of other issues it's become very hard to have a nuanced debate. And that's what I was curious about. Yeah, it seemed like I would have I would have expected you to get much less uh, media interviews and, and, and interest. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's an issue, even if Trump hadn't gone out there running rigged election, from what I understand from other election security advocates who have been advocating for security protections for longer than I have, anytime, whichever party is in power, 
tends to be less interested in election security. And you can kind of understand why. I mean, mm-hmm. you're, I, you have to speculate, but if they were able to come to power under the system, then the system must have worked. If they won their own races, then it's a little awkward for them to go out and say that we have election security concerns, but I think they have to find a way to do that because obviously not every race is going to be rigged. And the real problem that we have with our system is that it, it's not so much that we have rigged elections happening as as much as we don't know if we do or don't because we are not doing things that the experts say we need to do to detect potential malfeasance, which the number one thing is robust manual audits, and we do not do that nearly enough. And uh, sorry to keep harping on the polarization subject, but I'm curious, yeah. you have the uh, the normal, the person that was elected that side you know, not being as interested usually in, in uh, talking about election security. But do you think the the very polarized environment adds a good amount to that, would you say? Are oh, you yes. So, yes. Sorry. Um, yes. So even if we didn't have the polarizing rhetoric and conduct right now from coming from the right, I think there would have been a drop off in interest because Biden won, right. um, which is a shame because actually the Democrats did very, very poorly in every race other than the presidential race. And even in the presidential race, they did much, they, it's win or lose, but at the same time, they got, Biden got a, much fewer votes than he was expected to get. But yes, absolutely. Um, when you have the, on the right, yelling that it's a rigged election, there tends to be from what I've observed, a knee-jerk reaction from the left and really also, I'd say, from even the the middle mm-hmm. to say that, no, it's to maybe over to overstate the security of the election. And I do think that that is, to a large extent, what's happened. And I think really the most egregious example of that, unfortunately, being Chris Krebs, who was at CISA, the Department of, the Department of Homeland Security, and ran with this most secure election mm. ever narrative, which it may have been the most secure election ever, but it's very misleading to just kind of put that out there in a vacuum because the bar was really incredibly low. And, you know, it's unclear if if he's speaking of the presidential race. Well, yeah, there were more audits of the presidential race than ever in the past, but down ballot, that's not the case. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how the Trump accusations of of their side of what they uh, claim to be election illegitimacy is different from the things you're focusing on. And maybe you could talk a little bit about there's, you know, there's obviously very different ways in which an election can be illegitimate. Manipulated. What Trump has done is incredibly frustrating to me because it actually, it, it does take a fair amount of discipline to not overstate your case when you're looking at election system vulnerabilities and even, you know, unpredicted outcomes, poll defying outcomes. If you look back historically, the overwhelming majority of poll-defying results have tended to favor the Republican Party. A poll-defying result does not prove fraud, but when you see a pattern like that, it is very concerning. That also doesn't prove fraud, and a lot of people, even on the left, before, especially before this election, I think fell into the trap of sort of overstating what those anomalies implied and saying, oh, the GOP steals all these elections. And I was really careful to not do that because it's irresponsible and that isn't proof. It is, I think what it, when you have poll defying results in a certain pattern, it would put you on what I would call inquiry notice to look into it, but it's not proof in the sense of something that would stand up in court by any means. And Trump just ran away with, there, there is a grain of truth in the, or more than a grain of truth in the fact that our systems are vulnerable, but he took that as definitive proof of fraud and and then wove in a lot of um, a fi- what a fire hose of falsehoods on top of that. And so really, from what I can tell, I don't think they've come that Trump and his allies have come up with anything new. They I do see some of them repeating things that we knew before the election, for example, that ballot scanners, well, the ones supplied by ESNS anyway, America's largest voting machine vendor, do connect to the internet. But we knew that before the election. And, you know, a lot of the Trump supporters are discovering this for the first time and, and trying to cast that and mm. similar vulnerabilities as proof of fraud, which they are not. Have the way that people respond to your work and how that's changed, has that changed your own strategy and how you attempt to communicate the problem to people these days? Um, yes, it has. I haven't really quite worked out the best way to do it. I think my initial reaction was, was that 
we needed that the, the Republican Party had really hijacked, and specifically the Trump faction of the Republican Party, which is unfortunately most of it now, had hijacked and distorted the election security narrative to make themselves out to be victims. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel that the Democratic Party was messaging what I felt should be their number one point, which is that before the 2020 election, they had proposed, written and proposed an election security bill that would have really made the election a lot more secure than it was in that mm -hmm. it would have eliminated most paperless voting machines. It would have eliminated the, in, uh, banned that internet connectivity that I mentioned, and it would have required robust manual election audits for all federal races. And the Republican Party is, are the ones who wanted nothing of it, and they killed it. And I felt that that really should have been the message, the number one narrative from the Democrats. And I, that is something that I have messaged quite a bit since since the election, because for whatever reason, the Democratic Party chose to go with the it was a completely secure election no matter what. And their narrative really is concerning to me because 27 out of 27 House races that were predicted to be toss ups all went to the Republican Party. And those were not audited. I don't I doubt any of them. Well, maybe some of them were audited. If they were, it was not done in a way that election auditing experts consider meaningful. So I find that very concerning. So that's the, that is the main strategy that I've done. But one thing that I'm trying out a little bit because it is very hard, well, it is very hard to get attention from anyone on the left for any election security concerns anymore. I have to try to always make it clear in my social media post that, um, that my concern is that the GOP might cheat when of course it could go both ways, but I try to put in that, that my concern is that the GOP might abuse a vulnerability so that people don't assume that I am a Trump supporter. <laughs> right. You have to frame it in such a way it's like, so they can't misunderstand, you know, no, no, right. look, look what I'm actually. And the truth is before the election, it was really a non, a much more of a nonpartisan issue. It was actually kind of a relief. I, I was doing it out of concern that potentially the 2016 election had been stolen by Trump and that future elections might be stolen by the GOP, but it was still nonetheless a relatively nonpartisan concern. And that, should has, be. Yeah. that has really changed. And so it's, it's unfortunate to have to make it clear that I'm just saying, I'm just, my concern is that the GOP is going to cheat, but you know, the GOP doesn't need my help on messaging. They have a former president doing it and God knows billions of dollars probably pouring into that message. And really the Democrats are the ones who need to wake up. So I just try to make it very clear that I'm a Democrat. And, and we should also uh, point out too. I mean, it's not necessarily even the just the GOP cheating. It's like foreign nations meddling and things like that, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, could be a, a wide range of things. Could be a random hacker theoretically. Yeah. Well, I think more. In fact, I think that more often though, the tendency has well, the tendency among Democrats certainly was to think that Russia was our only concern, mm -hmm. or maybe China. You know, it could be China or Iran, but but not to ignore the domestic threat, which I think has always, frankly, been the more concerning the most concerning threat. It's just that it trickled out right. to the news that Russia was, that, that made it into the news stream that Russia was attempting to Yeah, the it. focus on Russia always seemed misplaced to me. It's, I mean, especially with, you know, when, with regards to the misinformation, it's like we have plenty of, uh, you know, domestic uh, fake news creators like uh, True Pundit, which is someone I researched and tried to find out his identity, which I thought was a, probably like the main misinformation creator that, that helped Donald Trump when he created all these fake, you know, Hillary Clinton news and things like that. But yeah, we definitely don't need any help to, uh, you know, we def definitely have some bad actors in the U.S. Yeah. Oh, there was one, something else I wanted to say on the shift in messaging. Um, one thing that I have been trying to emphasize a little more is the risk that someone, that if we don't have much more transparency, by which I mean largely um, public, truly robust manual audits, if we don't have that, then we are setting ourselves up again for bad actors to claim that even legitimate elections have been rigged. And I, I did message that before the election. It can go either way. When you don't have election transparency, you can either have be the victim of a fraudulent election or be the victim of people falsely claim, claiming that it was a fraudulent election. It's both, but I have been focusing more on the latter since the 2020 election because that's the only one of the only ways now to get the Democrats to pay attention. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, theoretically the thing that is even worse in terms of like, you can have a functioning society in government when even, even with a corrupt or an illegitimate election, but when you start to trust things, it's kind of like the run on the bank thing where that's when all this stuff really goes 
downhill is, you know, losing, losing that trust and everybody not having the trust. Yeah. Uh, right. But it does have to be a trustworthy process. And right now, I mean, the sad truth is it still is not, I don't, I don't believe it is particularly trustworthy. And a lot of people are um, operating under a false sense of security. Right. That's what you've been saying for, for a while is, is that there are people that, you know, there, there's people that want to handle it behind the scenes and not make people lose trust and, and try to handle it. Uh, even the people that are working for more trustworthy systems, they don't want to, they don't want the public to lose trust in it. But you're, you're of the opinion, yeah, no, we need to get this out there and, and uh, solve the problem and, and make people aware of it. Yeah. Right. I think, I mean, I understand that the, the concern of people who want to handle it behind the scenes, but I think we've really passed, they've been trying to handle it behind the scenes since electronic voting really became popularized around 2000, after 2002, it's the Help America Vote Act, which funded many of the electronic voting machines that we had really up until the 2018 and 2020 election, a lot of those machines were replaced. But I mean, we've had 15 years at least to try to handle this behind the scenes and put in place some laws that require real real checks on these electronic voting and it hasn't happened. And the only way, t- there really isn't any leverage to make it happen without the public's outrage. Mm. And so the public is the leverage. What I didn't mean, you know, certainly was ever to storm the Capitol and become violent over it. It, it seems to me that there should have been what I, I would have liked to see is that hap- and still would is a happy medium between sort of rolling over and playing dead, which is really what the Democrats generally do on this issue and, you know, becoming violent and having an insurrection, which was right. what Trump's response, you know, was. And well, and his was also just sort of a fake, a fake, he did not have evidence that that he really won the election. He didn't have that evidence. That is the big lie. There's yeah. a big difference between saying we have some problems and we should look into it and saying the election's rigged. Yeah, there there's there's just a big difference. Yeah. Right. And and speaking of the um the polarized dynamics of uh people on the liberal side not wanting to think about this now because of the dynamics now. I, I mean I I've had that, you know, feeling myself of I, I was in an interaction with a Trump supporter, you know, online, and he said something about election security. And I, my, my first instinct, you know, was really like, don't be an idiot, you know, and then, but, but, you know, it's, it's almost, it's, it's not really productive because it, in, unless you're talking about a specific thing, it's like, you know, he, he was basically saying we should want more election security. And I'm like, you know, I, I shouldn't call him an idiot for that. Yeah. Yes. I agree. There should be more election security. So I, one of the reasons I want to have this this talk with you was like, I can feel that uh, kind of, you know, response. And I think that's happening to many people, but it, do- it doesn't help the conversation to just be like, no, you idiot, don't worry about that. Um, well, I will say this. I think that this is one of the things that's driving me crazy is that I think that there is amidst, mostly it has been really bad <laughs> to have Trump take over this issue, mm-hmm. but there could have been a potential opportunity where Republican lawmakers for the first time might actually feel some pressure from them, their constituents to mm. not block an election, a, a meaningful election security bill. I mean, I don't know if that would be enough leverage or not, but there is some to use against them and the Democrats are not giving it a go. I mean, this is the mm. one time where they could say, you don't, you're not happy with the current audits that are conducted. Let's pass a law requiring much more meaningful ones across the board, not just for the races that the Republicans lose, but for all of them, that's how it's supposed to be. You don't get to just cherry pick, right? But let's let's do it across the board for the next election. And then, I mean, the worst case scenario, I think, is that they say no, in which case you have another, you have a good talking point. That's like the worst, which is mm-hmm. to show that they're hypocritical. And, and yeah, the GOP doesn't mind being hypocritical, but some of their voters truly believe that the election was stolen. And I, and I don't think they're all, that some of the Trump supporters are also not particularly happen with certain factions within the Republican Party, like the Mitch McConnell, mm-hmm. um, you know, Karl Rove, those Republicans, the sort of dinosaurs <laughs> within the party, they're not very happy with them. And they may actually, it could actually work. And it has been really disappointing to me that the Democrats haven't even tried. I mean, even the the number one champion of election security within Congress was Senator Ron Wyden. I was a huge fan. I mean, I don't want to say I'm not a fan anymore. And maybe that's not the right word to use for a member of Congress. But they should, you know, they shouldn't have fan clubs. But he was the only one in Congress who was really, even after 2016, there were not many members of Congress willing to be as transparent as I think they should have been about the risks to our election system. And he was one. Of, he was really the exception. And now he's gone completely silent 
on election security. And I, I do know that, so he's the one who wrote that election security bill that I mentioned. It was called the SAFE Act, and it was also called the PAVE Act. There was a version in the House and one in the Senate. It hasn't been reintroduced, and there have been aspects of it that have gone in and out of H.R. 1 and S.R. 1, the For the People Act. I don't believe even sort of the most important provision, which would be to have robust manual audits in 2022. I don't believe that that's currently in there. And that's just, inc- it's just incredibly disappointing. More than disappointing, it's devastating. I mean, yeah, it seems like, like you say, it just seems like a big opportunity to be like, yeah, let's, l- let's do something about this. Yeah. I, I just, I, I can't fathom what, what they're thinking other than to say, like, if they proposed a bill for better audits, that would acknowledge that our current audits aren't that great. But you know what? They're not that great. <laughs> it was already yeah. out there that we already had experts who are not, for the most part, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if they're registered Republicans or Democrats, but they're not big MAGA flying people who were saying we needed better audits for years, uh, 2016 to 2020. That was that was their rallying cry. And yeah, so we should just do this. But we're not. I got to be honest and say I'm, I'm just uh, I'm frequently disappointed in how little it seems people attempt to speak to both sides and be like, look, let's use this anger you've and frustration you've got over here in something that benefits both people. I mean, I could go into a lot of examples of that, but yeah, I agree, I agree with you. It's like, it just seems like so much opportunities for something that, uh, getting something that both sides would agree on. I just don't see that very often. Yeah. Well, they may be doing it on this issue be, again behind the scenes, but mm-hmm. they're not telling the public. And I, I do believe the court of public opinion provides leverage. It just, I, I believe that it does. And Trump understood that too much. You know, he weapon, truly weaponized it and the Democrats do not understand it enough. And I don't think they clearly don't have, you know, these these workshops and things that churn out Democratic lawmakers and and politicians training them on messaging. But the Republicans do the Leadership Institute and they use it, in my opinion, they use it for nefarious reasons, really, truly to mislead people and to try to take everything over and, and lead us toward a less Democratic government. I am a Democrat, so that is my view of it. But the, there are some things on the techniques of persuasion that the Democrats should be making use of, and they mm-hmm. do not. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to the, you know, the different ways for an election to be corrupted or be illegitimate, I mean, it seems like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, you know, the Trump side of things is seems more worried or their claims are more about people who voted in person and whereas you're more worried about like actual digital hacking, but am I wrong on that? I mean, I I guess they're also concerned with the hacking, but it seems like they're also a big part of their thing is concerned about actually people voting falsely. Is that, am I right on that? Um, To an extent. So historically, and I believe it started in the Bush years, um, I think during George W. Bush's first term, there was a big push, I believe started by Karl Rove, to uh, work everyone up into a froth over voter fraud by individual fo- voters. So there's there's sort of two terms that often get used interchangeably, but they're really different. And voter fraud is by individual voters. So their theory is that you have all these people who are not reg- who didn't register to vote, and suddenly they're showing up on election day and they're voting illegally, or they're voting like in the wrong pre. You know, they're voting mm. all in in a swing state when they don't belong there. Just like buses of people being, of individuals. Like that there's all these, that there would really be thousands of individual voters willing to risk prison time to do this. That is their, that is voter fraud. And that has been a theory that they have, well, it's not that it's, I mean, it does happen. Absolutely it happens. But there's no evidence that it, I don't think that it happens more by Democrats than by Republicans. Or at um, any sort of scale. Or, But the bigger issue is that I don't think it happens at scale. There's no evidence that it happens at scale, and it's not that hard to detect it either. So, in fact, the Bush administration spent five years trying to find it, and they really and they failed. But that has stuck around. Election fraud typically refers to fraud committed by either by hacking or election insiders of the voting machines. It could be election fraud of the paper ballots, I suppose, like if it's mail ballots and they're stored in a warehouse, like Mm. swapping them out for other mail ballots. Or destroying them. But yeah, election fraud, the type of election fraud that I usually focus, has focused on mostly is involving the voting machines. And for the first time, there are really, this is the Trump administration or 
Trump really touted this risk of voting machine fraud. He he took over that issue. They never really made a big. They had had the Republican Party had really very little concern about electronic election fraud, and in fact, again, that was the the Safe Act. They the Republican Party blocked it gleefully blocked it before the 2020 election, which is was devoted to securing the electronic aspect of our election system. So that part was new. And then the part, the concern about uh, vote by mail is is incredibly tricky because at least before this election, most election security advocates would have said, or at least most of the ones that I knew, that vote by mail is a bit of a concern, not mostly for the reasons that Trump was talking about, which had to do with like China sending in ballots on bamboo paper that would some, that would be very difficult to pull off because on the receiving end, election official or election workers have to make sure that the ballots were uh, came from a registered voter. So you'd have to ha- still hack something. You'd have to hack a, you'd have to add them to the voter registration system or, or do something with the voter registration system. Otherwise, Quick question there. Yeah, they're checking the, the votes of the things that come in against the voter registration to ensure right. the name that on level. the envelopes. Right. I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't get that they're checking that against the, the rolls or whatever. Yeah. Right. So you'd have to somehow all those ballots would have to have a registered voter's name on there. And they also have to be, there are different formats for the ballots down to, it might even go below the county level, but certainly at the county level, there are lots of, so they'd have to have all of these different, have it formatted exactly correctly. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just not realistic. Mm-hmm. So that, it was not, but there are other concerns. Um, the one that I was always worried about was that people would not receive their ballots on time or at all. And I remain very concerned on that. I've been just recently trying to look and see what the statistics were for the 2020 election, but it it was an unprecedented election in, in that we also had so much more vote by mail and at the last second and a lot of people using vote by mail, a lot of jurisdictions using it on en masse for the first time. They may have had it for a limited number of voters. But that was always my biggest concern, and that has not really so much been the Trump administration or the former Trump administration's concern. I, I'm really worried that there could be even hacking of the online absentee ballot request system. Mm. That it could be something could be done to it to make someone's request invalidated, and then they don't receive their ballots. And certainly, you saw these large pockets of voters, I think especially in Georgia, who did not who said that they never received, they requested their absentee ballots and they never arrived. And hmm. that hasn't received enough attention, I don't think. And I'm worried that we are having a knee jerk response saying, you know, vote by mail is what saved us. And frankly, it may have been what saved us. I, I No one really knows. I mean, um, on the presidential race, uh, but I, there are risks with vote by mail and we should never, any system can be manipulated. Mm-hmm. Some are maybe riskier than others, but we have to really watch ourselves and not assume that any of these systems cannot be manipulated because with enough uh, focus and attention, they probably all can be. It's just a matter of whether it can scale, how much it can scale up and and how easy it is to detect. Yeah. Speaking of the Democrat messaging on this, it seems like, I mean, one thing that stands out to me is Trump was basically denigrating the election since he won, even when he won in 2016 and still did nothing really to, to do anything about that, you know, so he, he, he's the guy whining about the election in 2020 when he, even if there, there was a problem with the election, like that's pretty much on him because it, he seemed like he didn't care at all about, you know, actually doing anything to, uh, exactly. to solve the pro- solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, there was, so there was another election security bill that w- it was not nearly as good as the SAFE Act, which was the SAFE Act was written by Senator Ron Wyden, but there was another one, Secure Elections Act, that was really championed more by Amy Klobuchar and because it was bipartisan. But I personally don't think it really would have done much to even – I'd have to look at it again, but the audit provisions were not that great and that it kind of broke down along those lines. But as I recall, Trump said he would veto it anyway. I mean, he was not interested in securing the election, right. although, I mean, they did – we did set up the um, – God, I forgot what the initial, individual initials stand for, but that whole CISA program, I believe, was set up after 2016. So it wasn't that there were no improvements. It's just that even to the extent that CISA came up with guidelines for election officials to follow, they were voluntary guidelines. And CISA also, it, it did run some scans, but the public has no idea which officials let them run the scans and which ones didn't, or even what ex- which systems they were scanning. And I'd say equally important, CISA's scans can only detect known malware. And so, for example, CISA missed the SolarWinds attack, which was apparently not on our election system, but on other government 
agencies. Massive, massive hack, and they missed it precisely for that reason, because the hackers didn't use, they used a new type, a new malware, new vulnerability. So CISA's ability to detect um, foreign hacking, I think, is not as, it's not as perfect as they would like people to believe. Hmm. I'd read some takes on the Republicans' idea of requiring voter ID that even many, a good chunk of liberals are, you know, when polled are actually for that. And maybe it's not that bad an idea. Would you have a take on that? That is not an area that I have studied all that much, in part because in the abstract, it does sound kind of reasonable to want some form of ID. People that I respect feel really strongly that maybe that shouldn't be required. And so I just haven't studied it enough. My personal view right now, but it is not set in stone, is that some form of ID, voter ID is fine. I don't really have an objection to that. I think that as with every as with everything else, the Republican Party tends to abuse voter ID any chance that they get. And so they'll, with their, for example, the exact match versions that they tried to get away with, uh, where on one ID it has their middle name and on the other it doesn't, they would turn away people. That's an abuse, an abuse of it. And also making it so that like a gun, like your, uh, your NRA card, I don't know if it's literally your NRA card, but your gun license works, but a student ID, students tend to vote liberal, right? They tend to be liberal. A student ID does not. So there have been a lot of abuses. And then, um, you know, they do things like closing down the DMV near where the poorer areas are to make it harder for people to get to get an ID. And and I do have sympathy also for people who say mm-hmm. there should be no ID. I, I get it. Or at least, so for example, my father, who he did, he passed away this last year. He was 90 and he had a lot of mobility problems and his ID expired a whole long time ago. And you know, I, I was in charge of his money for the most part, and he didn't really want to vote, I don't think, in the last election. But before that, he did, up until this last one. And um, I don't know, it's elderly people, mobility is often an issue, and they may not have a current ID. So, for you know, his passport had expired like 10 years ago. In California, I think it's still fine. He was able to use it the last time he voted, but in one of these other states, he wouldn't be able to. And I really don't see why even an expired ID, as long as it shows who you are, why does it not need to be not expired? Do you, are you no longer a person if just because your driver's license expired? Yeah. And, and like you point out too, I mean, those, those votes are getting checked against a role of, of eligible voters. I I think some people have the perception that, oh, if you, if you vote, that's just an extra vote, but they're getting checked. I mean, yes, they, they check a, a voter list when you go to vote in person, and they check a voter list when you mail it in. Some of the, uh, the fears around this that they're, you know, for one, the, the idea that there's a, a bunch of illegal immigrants voting or something is just kind of, it's just ludicrous to me. Like, do they you think- Risk deportation. <laughs> illegal <Yes>. immigrants. <laughs> yeah, they would, they would risk deportation. Uh, go out, you know, th- their main concern is probably just not drawing attention to themselves, but they're going to risk all of that attention and theoretical deportation just to cast a single vote. Like that, that is, that's insane. That me. is, that is, that is uh, the whole thing that it is insane. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the reason why it's hard to imagine any kind of attempt at scale for in-person exactly. uh, fraud, you know, other than a few one-off instance, instances in general. Yeah. A little note, I made an edit here, and I'm cutting to a part where we started talking about how in the 2016 election, Trump's win defied all polling. And also in that election, Republicans won so many close races for Congress, too. To quote from one of Jennifer's pieces, which you can find on Medium, quote, the GOP won all 27 out of 27 House races that were rated as toss-ups before the election, end quote. And to Jennifer and some other people, those kinds of patterns are pretty concerning and another reason to want to ensure elections have more integrity. Back to the interview. And I'm curious with the poll defying results. I mean, it seems like there's other theoretical dynamics going on that could help explain that. Like maybe, you know, conservative votes are undercounted in the polls they attempt to do, maybe because they're more rural or that, you know, I've seen ideas too, that sometimes the shy Republican voter, they don't, yeah, the shy, yeah there's some other ideas right. like that, or they don't really even know what they're, which way they're going to go sometimes till they get in the booth and then they end up voting mostly how their family or, or friends vote or whatever. I think it's possible. Um, I think it's possible that, that I guess with 2016, what was unusual is that in the swing States, they were so far mm. off, but then nationally they were not as much so. So when you see that pattern, when you see the whole thing kind of shifted to the right, because it's almost always to the right, 
yeah, you could say maybe systemically that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, that's why it isn't proof. And I think really the main reason why it isn't proof is because the methodologies are just like the inside of a voting machine. They're not made public. And in fact, after the two th uproar over the 2004 presidential election, there was a request, I want to say, I think it was by Congress. Um, it's possible it was by election um, attorneys who were uh, had a lawsuit going in connection with that election, but there was an attempt to subpoena the polling, the exit polling company's records to find out to get the raw data, and they re they refused. If Trump had won the twenty twenty election, can you imagine a reality where it was the liberal side that had a large chunk of of their side believing that the election was illegitimate? Can you imagine something like that happening where there were you know protests and and people uh, being upset like that? Um, I can imagine a lot of people questioning it. I, I don't know what the statistics are about how many Democrats questioned the 2016 election. It was, a, mm -hmm. it was a decent chunk. So, yes, but I don't think, no, the Democrats, obviously there's some exceptions, but they would not have, I, I find it very hard to imagine a scenario where they would have been violent like that. And there are too many on the left too many people on the left who have undermined concerns about election, what I think were legitimate concerns about election security for too long, who would have come out and, and done that again. And again, you would have had Chris Krebs. And, you know, one thing that has been actually remarkably consistent is that Democratic, the sort of the government officials, the FBI and the CIA and all those people always want to say the election is legitimate no matter what. So, you know, and when Trump won, they all, I think it was false assurances. I don't think they really knew, but at least not when they first came out and said it. They came out and said, oh, this was a, they overstated their ability to know whether the outcome was correct. They said, you know, this was a legitimate result. They did the same. So they did it for Trump and then they did it also for Biden. So, no, I mean, no matter which way it goes, they're, they're going to say that it is, it, they're going to sort of overstate the security of the election. And I, I really, it really did, I believe, ben benefit the Republican Party in 2020, even though it may seem like it didn't. But there were just too many. There was supposed to be a big blue wave. Remember all the talk of the blue wave? That did not happen at all. Not at all. And we are really backed up against a wall now. I know the polling suggested that. But yeah, then, then you had the other side of Trump supporters being like, we thought we were going to be. How could, it, how could it even be so close? Because... We know we knew we were going to win in the landslide, but that wasn't really based on actual polling. Or <laughs> it wasn't based on no their own poll. Even mm -hmm. Fox News's poll showed that Trump was going to get killed. And I I saw a reference. I think even Trump's internal polling, but I could be wrong about that one. That might have been from 2016. Also, when they say that they they base it on the size of their rallies, which is really not not a great indicator. I mean, you also have they're willing to get out there and be big mouths. So you you know you have the um, same kind of crowd that the MAGA is now flooding the public school board meetings. Does that mean that more uh, MAGA, more MAGAs than Democrats care about public schools? No, they're just really, really loud, and they and they like going out there and getting together and being big bullies. So. That's my that is my very partisan take on it, but I also think it's objectively true to a, to an extent. Yeah, when I was talking about the alternate reality where there was a you know Trump winning and a liberal percent of the population that was up in arms or angry, you know, I definitely wasn't um, implying that it would that it would be an exact parallel, but I can imagine a situation in which uh, there were protests of of a good percentage of people believing it was false for various reasons, like of the things that had already come out, like the USPS. Uh, shenanigans that were perceived and other things. I can imagine a scenario where uh, there were a lot of DC protests and Trump cracked down really hard, which led to escalations and violence and things like that. I don't think so. It's actually, it's actually very disappointing. The Democrats just, um, I studied a little bit about how to have effective protests. And, and the one thing that MAGA's had right was that you kind of need to do it nearby where the decision makers mm -hmm. are. I don't mean that they did it, they were right to go inside or anything. But they were right in terms of if you want to have an impact, um, putting aside, obviously should not never be violent, you should never break in, putting all that part aside, but to actually be nearby. Um, and I think that the Democrats have gone more with local marches. And it's partly because we just can't seem to get our outrage up. Part of that is also we're more responsible about the pandemic, which also, by the way, would have affected the crowds, obviously, coming up to the 2020 election, whereas the MAGA said it was a hoax. The pandemic, the Democrats were all hunkering down at home. But 
if we didn't go out and protest the family separation policy, the zero tolerance, that to me is the most disappointing mm. thing that has happened. That's almost disappointed me more than almost anything else in our country. Um, that even a lot of the uh, liberal-minded resistance attorneys who are the most respected and have the ear of the media didn't call that as a grounds for impeachment. I absolutely think it could have been a grounds for impeachment. I think it should have been. And it's because we're not it was such an unprecedented situation that they couldn't fathom it as a crime. But of course it's a crime. I absolutely, it was certainly an abuse of power. And if we belong to the criminal court, which we don't, but if we did, I, I absolutely think it is the type of thing that should have gone to the Hague. And I still do. And it, I, it just kind of um, shook me to my core that that was not a bigger deal. Well, it seems like uh, liberals in general are more fractured, whereas conservatives are generally more cohesive, I feel like. Uh, one thing I've seen is so many liberal people act as if people on the right are horrible people for believing the election was illegitimate. And I think these people who think that are, I also think that they're wrong, that they're misinformed, that they've been misled by powerful people and media telling them bad information. Uh, but when it comes to the individuals who believe that I don't think that there are horrible people just for believing that. I think it's clearly very easy for people to be fooled by all sorts of things these days, especially in a very polarized environment. So I'm curious, do you have some empathy for uh, people who uh, believe that the election was rigged or suspect it was rigged? Do you And do you think the animosity around this topic is misplaced and prevents us from you know, speaking persuasively and getting people on the same page and such? In the abstract, I could have empathy, but I don't really have much room for it because I think we are truly dealing with a fascist movement. If the Republican Party or if any of the leaders, even if freaking Mike Lindell was to propose legislation that would require manual audits for the next election across the board, I might, I probably would support that legislation. They have not done one thing to suggest that this is anything other than propaganda. Although Mike Lindell does seem, you know, maybe he believes his own propaganda. I don't know. But, um, and I don't think so. I Sorry, think... I just want to say, I, when I asked that question, it was definitely about separating the the everyday citizens from the leaders, because I feel like, yeah, Mike Lindell and Trump and, and these people, if we separate the people who are, you know, leading the thing. I versus... don't think you can. I don't think you really can, because so in my experience in the election integrity movement, um, you know, I'm on an email list with maybe 120 people who've been looking at election integrity for a long time, and most of them are not leaders in, I don't, I don't know if any of them are what you would call leaders um, in the Trump movement. However, there are some who believe it was rigged, and they have been, I found them to be mostly insufferable. And they have bought, it's usually not, it's not in a vacuum. They've sort of bought everything hook, line and sinker. Mm -hmm. And they think unless you open your eyes and acknowledge that it was rigged or that, that some sort of equivalence at the, at the very least, they want some kind, they, they want all the attention on dominion voting machines and possibility that the election was stolen from Trump. And they don't want, they have no concern whatsoever for looking at down ballot races or looking at ESNS, for example. And so among my limited experience with people who feel the way you described who are not leaders, um, I had some empathy and then I lost it because for the most part, they sort of bought the Kool-Aid overall. I guess what I keep coming no, back I to No, I have is... no sympathy. I don't. I'm <laughs> I, sorry. I don't. I, I keep coming you back gotta to... You've got to have some personal responsibility for this. And um, if I'm able to figure out that vulnerabilities don't prove fraud, they can't be so stupid that they come to a different conclusion. I'm sorry. On an individual level, though, I mean, clearly people can be deceived. I mean, I know liberal people who I think are very deceived about different things. And I, I just, it comes back to me to, I mean, you've got various shades of, of badness, too. You've got people who are the lead, what we can view as the leaders and manipulators. Then you've got people that are the biggest believers of them. And then you've got the people that maybe have their doubts, you know, not everybody polled in the Republican party believes it, uh, maybe some suspect it, you know, and, and I guess what I keep coming back to is talking as if the other side is all one way, as if it's like you morons. I, I guess that's what is, is bothers me. Yeah. I try to avoid name calling. I don't think name calling helps, but if you're an adult and you are unable to 
to do some degree of fact checking and you're um, sort of and you're excusing in any sense you know well oh, well maybe they got a little carried away but I understand why they were all so upset I, no I don't I don't have sympathy I really have lost sympathy um, there's a real mean streak that has gone through the whole MAGA movement and I don't have sympathy for that I don't I mean if there's anything we've learned in the past four years it's that people are very fallible when it comes to ideas. Well, that is true. And I am very interested in, in how people can be fooled. And I think that we were fooled on the left. I think a lot of people were fooled on the left by the false assurances, for example, from Jim Comey and James Clapper when they came out and said, you know, it would be, have been, it would be almost impossible to hack voting machines because they never connect to the internet. That was untrue. And to this day, I think probably most people believe what they said because Part of the reason because they are public officials, they're at the top of our government and they were appointed or nominated or at least tolerated by the Obama administration and Obama was this Democrat who a lot of people still celebrate and therefore, I mean, it's going to take a lot to persuade people that what they said wasn't true. Um, and that is, I don't know if they knew what they said wasn't true or, or if they were lied to themselves, but what I find really inexcusable is that there's never been an accounting for that. We deserve to know why they thought what they thought. That When they said that voting machines never connect to the internet, were they trying to mislead us? Did they not know about, at the very least, it's misleading. Um, was it the vendors who told them this? And how do we prevent it from happening again? But right now they haven't even acknowledged they got it wrong. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I am absolutely aware that people on both sides can be duped. And I think it's really important to explain to people how that it's happened to them. And I do try to do that a bit on the left because I think you have to know that otherwise your guard isn't up for the next time it might happen. It's the lack of nuance when everything becomes us versus them. And when the other side takes a stance, we have to take the opposite stance and instead of looking for the nuance or the common ground or whatever. Yeah. One more question I have is uh, when it comes to uh, the court cases, like all the court cases that Trump lost, it would seem to me and it would seem to you know a lot of people on, on the left that that's a pretty good indicator that there's not much validity there for those cases, especially when you factor in like the Supreme Court, which was conservative heavy, didn't even hear one of the cases and such. Uh, but I'm curious, can you imagine a situation where you and other election security interested people had very valid points about an election being compromised? And can you imagine there being brought legal challenges and losing them? And, and I guess, in other words, I'm saying, is the argument that, well, they lost those legal challenges, is, is that always so foolproof an argument? No, losing legal challenges is not always foolproof proof because they can be lost on procedural issues like lack of standing. And I believe some of those, it may even be most of them, for all I know, it's all of them, were dismissed on procedural issues like lack of standing um, or I don't know what the other grounds would be. I did not, I stopped looking at the lawsuits. I looked at a few of them. I stopped looking at them because it felt to me that the sheer volume of what they were churning out, what the legal team was churning out, was absolutely a, the propaganda method known as the um, fire hose of falsehoods, mm. where you, you use multiple channels and just keep churning it out without really any, even any real attempt to make sure to vet any of it first. And that's the point. As soon as something's debunked, you just say, okay, well, never right. mind that. That was just a mistake. Let's move on to the next thing. And it seemed to me that that's what they were doing. And nobody really could keep up in real time. The few times I did check, I was appalled. Um, so I would read through, I read through some affidavits because they would go around that email group I mentioned. And some of the people who were sympathetic to Trump are like, oh, well, look at this. But the truth is I knew more about the voting machine industry than I think some, some of the people who were touting these affidavits. And I was appalled. They would have people who would be an expert maybe in some area, computers or something, you know, with a doctor in front of their name, they had a PhD, saying that um, Dominion had acquired ESNS or it was else it was backwards. The reason that they did that is because, frankly, ESNS has, has a lot more sketchy behavior, but the chosen enemy, you know, in, in order to one propaganda method is to have a designated enemy and they'd already designated Dominion. And so they had to make, they just tried to lump everything under the Dominion umbrella. And I knew that Dominion hadn't bought ESNS or vice versa. I mean, I've been studying them for years. That was just completely made up. But because it was an expert in an affidavit, if you file something in court, people don't believe that anyone would be so crass as to knowingly lie or just make stuff up in a court affidavit. But that's absolutely what they did. 
you know, they did other stuff like um, they, they mixed up Michigan and Minnesota data and they were <laughs> pumping this. I don't know if this made it into the lawsuit or not, but certainly it was went viral on social media that there was more than 100 percent turnout in Michigan. And it was turned out that wasn't true. It was because their expert, again, an expert had mixed up the data from the two different states. And it did not appear to me, one of the affidavits was from, she was like a pro-Trump podcaster who, I mean, yeah, tangentially, she had done some contract work for the military intelligence unit, I guess, but she didn't have any special expertise in this area. She, apparently she never talked even to the legal team. They, she had been posting her affidavit on social media and Sydney Powell team just took it and stuck it in their lawsuit. You can't do that. I mean, it's really appalling stuff. I would say that just because your suit is dismissed, that doesn't mean you didn't have some valid arguments. Although in this case, I really don't know that they did have any valid arguments. And so many rejected. And, and also I'd say the, the fire hose method of that, all those cynical and uh, low information lawsuits allows them to be like, look, there's stuff going on, which is, you know, when I, when I looked at conversations around this, it was usually like, well, look, look at all the things that are being filed. Look over here. There's more stuff going on here. You know, it just allows the perception that, oh, there's all these things going on. And because you have a lawyer and you wouldn't believe that they would abuse the court process to that extent. I mean, you have to, it takes a long time to get a law degree and you have your whole, your reputation at stake, but they did not, from the affidavits that I read, there was not even an attempt to try to, to be ethical in making their arguments. And the other thing I'd like to say is I just really want to emphasize this is that Trump did much, much better than all of the polls predicted. And typically when you have had people question outcomes, it's when you have an unexpected result. This is the exact opposite. So they didn't even have that, which again, that wouldn't even be, I wouldn't consider that what I would call evidence because the polls are not transparent and, and there is some art to them. But at least you would normally at least have that. They didn't even have that basic sort of threshold or at least something close. It was, you know, that the polls showed that it would be close. They didn't even have that. So I think it's really is a bad faith abuse of the election process. And just it does show how through sheer repetition and the creation of multiple channels. So I think that new own and Newsmax were largely developed to help this fire hose of falsehoods um, propaganda work because you you need it it certainly works a lot better if you have supposedly separate outlets saying the same thing and look it's over here too and it's over there too well it must be real if fox and own and newsmax are all saying this it's not just fox anymore so there's a uh, if anyone's interested in in that there's a good wikipedia uh, about the post election lawsuits related to the 2020 election that goes into detail on all those things and has good references and footnotes and such. And uh, I'll say too, the Lindell stuff, if you're listening to this and think, oh, Mike Lindell has got some evidence. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Like if that person, if Mike Lindell had evidence, he would put it very transparently out there. He put it on a website. He would get a, a lawyer bringing lawsuits. He would, I mean, even Fox News won't even listen to him now. He, he He's not, a, he's persona non grata there so you have to ask yourself he's moving the goalposts yeah, exactly. there's nothing there i mean if anybody it'll had... be later next tuesday he's like wimpy with the burger you know i put my mail my check in the mail he's on tuesday milking the milking the thing as, as trump was doing and you know i i've talked to you know because I, I make a point to try to talk to trump supporters to figure out you know what they're thinking and i've talked to people that are like oh no he's he's just holding on to it for these reasons and there's always these excuses for like why why can't you just put out like in a very easy to understand uh, method, what evidence you have, but he, he can't do that. And he won't do that for, for obvious reasons. So. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say about litigation though, is that I have long felt that the burden of proof is backwards in the U S when it comes to election hacking, given the ease with which virtually all independent election security experts say that totals that vote tallies could be hacked, that it requires that a losing candidate or member of the public um, have evidence that potentially enough votes were changed to change the result. And it's very difficult to, it's almost impossible to have that evidence given that it's the vendor and the election officials that have exclusive access to that mm. evidence. So it makes, it has created this impossible burden. And that's why it's so important to have legislation that requires public manual audits um, as a matter of course regardless of who wins or the margin of victory so that you don't have this impossible setting where you have 
no one can challenge really realistically, almost no one can realistically challenge a result because they can't get access to the evidence. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, maybe that's a good place to stop unless you have any other uh, things you wanted to mention about um, your work or, or things you're working on or how to, people can follow you. One thing, there's something to keep an eye on, which is that it was uh, a pro-Trump clerk in Colorado illegally obtained and leaked the software to the election management system for Dominion voting. And apparently it's used in a multiple multitude of states. The election management system is the centralized county computer that is used to program all voting machines in a county. And it's also used to aggregate all of the precinct totals on election night. And so having leaked that software is kind of a big deal. This wasn't something that was already out in the wild or on the black market as far as anybody knows. It was this um, MAGA clerk in Colorado who leaked it. And um, I believe 60% of counties in California use Dominion voting, which means they use those election management systems. And truthfully, the California Secretary of State should already have decided to conduct a robust manual. It's what's called a risk limiting audit is the one most experts recommend of this recall election that's coming up, the re attempted recall of Governor Newsom. But given the historic importance of this race, I think it is truly democratic malpractice to not do it. And especially given this um, leak of the software to the Dominion system. So really there needs to be much more pressure put on the California Secretary of State to commit to this now because you don't want to have a situation where you, you try to audit it. You, you start seeking new kinds of review after the fact, which is what Trump did. You need to have this in place beforehand. So no matter which way it goes, we get a transparent review that everyone is comfortable with. That all sounds reasonable to me, yeah. And if people do want to follow me, I'm mostly on Twitter, um, at Jenny Cohn1, J-E-N-N-Y-C-O-H-N-1. And I'm also on Medium under Jennifer Cohn. And I do have a YouTube channel called Voting Machine Corruption. And I'll say I read that recent Medium post you had about your summary of your concerns about the 2016 election. That was a really good read. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. That was Jennifer Cohn, election security advocate. If you're listening to this and you're a Trump supporter who believes the 2020 election was rigged or likely rigged, you probably also believe that liberal media is very biased, that it spreads bad ideas to people. You may even believe that there's a purposeful agenda going on, that liberal-leaning media is a form of propaganda, a form of brainwashing. So I'd ask you, are you willing to apply that skepticism you have for liberal-leaning media to the news and media that you consume? Are you brave enough to apply that skepticism everywhere and not just towards the people and news you hate? Because I would actually agree with you that there are some very misled and gullible liberal people who believe whatever they read or see in liberal-leaning news, or immediately believe whatever thing they see people on their side sharing on social media. And some of those people drum up unreasonable amounts of hatred towards conservatives as a whole. All of that is a problem. But is it at least possible that you're very similar to those people that you're angry about? Is it possible that you're not questioning things in a similar way? Is it possible you're looking for easy answers? Is it possible that having to question the ideas of your family and friends makes you uncomfortable? Is it possible you're being led by your emotions and anger and not by your reason? I challenge you to apply that skepticism you have for the other side's news to all news, including to the views of people who you know who are sharing stuff on Facebook and other social media. I dare everyone to do that, really, because I think our problem isn't so much that we're not all believing, quote, the right information, because we'll never all believe the same things. But more our problem is that we aren't skeptical enough about things in general, including the things from people on our own side. Uncertainty makes us nervous, so we look for easy good versus bad and easy us versus them narratives. We flee from nuance because, as a previous guest, Kerry Callahan, said, the complexity of the truth is inconvenient for both sides. I also want to point out that when I or others try to talk about having empathy for, quote, the other side, I think a lot of people misunderstand this. For example, my attempt to imagine a scenario where Trump had won and liberals were the ones doubting the election or theoretically engaging in violence, that wasn't an attempt to create a false equivalency. For example, I don't think Democrat leaders are anywhere near as bad or as ignorant or as reckless as Trump is. So if something had happened like that, it would have played out very differently. But that idea was an attempt to say the things that we think are so horrible about some people in the other group are often just true about people in our own group. 
It's clear that, for example, many liberals have had overconfident beliefs that the 2016 election was illegitimate. And it's easy to imagine if Trump had won in 2020, because Trump was the one with the power, there would have been many more liberals who thought that. So my point is just that people at an individual level, no matter their political beliefs, can have bad ideas, can believe the things they want to believe without much evidence. They can be fooled, they can be misled. We all have reasons for what we do. All of us have blinders and biases of various sorts. And obviously some people, let's face it, are just plain dumb, but that doesn't necessarily make them bad people. And I'd say also, COVID lockdowns and COVID stresses of various kinds have played a role in amplifying people's instability and bad behavior. And obviously there are also just some mean and bad people, some narcissistic people, some people who just want to watch the world burn. People are complicated. So my focus on trying to understand people at an individual level is an attempt to try to break us of thinking in terms of monolithic groups, because that is how we are drawn to think. We're drawn to thinking that group is like this, and that group is all as bad as their worst people. And that mindset is, I believe, a big part of our problem. I don't think it's a side problem to me and to people who study polarization dynamics. I think many of them would also say it's very much a core component of our problem. It is why polarization amplifies and builds in so many cases and tears societies apart. Thinking in terms of groups and our group versus that group is the path of least resistance. And maybe if we all tried a little bit to stop thinking in that way, if we recognize just how much variety of thought and ideas and motivations there are in the other group, if we saw them as more like our group and having a bunch of different stances on issues and in having reasons for what they believe and reasons for why they're angry, Or even if we just recognize their fallibility as humans, like we and the people we know and love can be very fallible, even stupid. I think if we thought more like this, we'd speak in less polarizing ways. We'd speak in more persuasive ways. We'd aim our speech more at the people who think more like us, who aren't the extreme people. For example, did you know that polls show that around 30% of Republicans are pro-choice, and similarly, that about 30% of Democrats are pro-life? Did you know that about 30% of Republicans want more strict gun controls? Did you know that about 60% of Democrats polled in 2021 were in favor of requiring voter ID to vote? Did you know that about a third of Hispanic voters and a third of Muslim voters voted for Trump in 2020? Did you know that polls found that somewhere between 10 to 15% of 2016 Trump voters had previously voted for Obama? Those are just a few random tidbits, but my point is just Our group versus group psychology makes us perceive groups as monolithic, but we need to see that groups are illusions. There are no groups. It's just a bunch of people, a bunch of individuals with a wide variety of beliefs and motivations. And the important part there is that people are able to change their minds, and they're more likely to do that when we talk about them and to them as if they were individuals, not as if they are just a group, not as if they were all as stupid and despicable as that group's worst members. And I'd also say doing all that in no way subtracts from our ability to work hard and fight for the things we believe. I'd argue it just makes us stronger. There's a common phrase in conflict negotiation that goes something like, be tough on concepts, but soft on people. We can fight for the things we believe in while recognizing that the people around us are humans like us. They have reasons for what they do. They're angry at our group in a way that can be quite similar to the way we're angry at their group in the sense that they perceive the most angry and unreasonable people on our side as representing our whole group. And obviously we can believe that those perceptions are false and exaggerated while still attempting to understand their points of view and figure out how to address them. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zachary Elwood. Learn more at behavior-podcast.com. Music by Small Skies. Small Skies.